Okay, well, welcome. Um, Stephen Pickford, uh, I've known you for probably about 20 years in different capacities. I met you working for the Treasury. It was a great privilege to work with you on things like Iraq, 9-11 and Turkey, all of which seem like tiny crises at the moment. But uh, my viewers probably won't have met you. So um, can I ask you just to tell us a bit about yourself? Okay, um, my name is Stephen Pickford. I uh, retired about 10 years ago from full-time work. Um, I spent most of my career working in the, as an economist in various uh, government departments, uh, most latterly in the Treasury. I spent a couple of periods working abroad. Um, and my last job was as uh, the finance deputy for G7, G20 meetings. Right. So um, you were going to tell me, for the sake of students who weren't have heard of this, as I hadn't before I jo joined the Treasury, what a, a G7 deputy is um, and, uh, and and what you did as G7 deputy. OK, um, well, the G7 are a group of countries, the largest industrial countries in the world. And for 20 or 30 years, they have uh, met together, they have coordinated where they wanted to on economic policy matters. Um, the meetings tended to be with finance ministers, in our case the Chancellor of the Exchequer, um, um, but they don't do the mundane work. The mundane work, more mundane work and preparation for those meetings was done by, uh, by civil servants um, uh, working for each of them. We were the G7 finance deputies, um, and we prepared prepared for their meetings. We drafted communiques. Um, we tried to make the, the interactions between the ministers as smooth as possible. Okay, so um, the, sorry, far away. Uh, and during the during the um, the great financial crisis, um, I guess. We spent a lot of time talking to each other um, uh, between the deputies. We would hold teleconferences to discuss uh, what, what on earth was going on. Uh, we'd try to warn each other when, when one of us was uh, taking policy actions so the rest were, were informed. And I guess our biggest task was to prepare for the, uh, what turned out to be the G20 summits in Washington and London in late 2008 and early 2009, uh, which pr prepared a, a fairly comprehensive response to the crisis. So you would be given a, a broad idea by someone like, would be Alistair Darling, wouldn't it? Um, and you would have to work out and negotiate the details with your counterparts. Um, so, uh, for example, the global stimulus package of 2008 to nine would have been that sort of thing. That's, that's correct, yes. I mean, uh, an awful lot of work was done by all of our respective departments, um, but we would, we would essentially be trying to uh, get uh, other countries uh, onto the same page so that we could, we could have a coordinated package to, uh, to stimulate our economies, to um, uh, try and redress the financial regulation problems that that uh, caused the crisis in the first instance. Uh, to get get people to contribute to build up the IMF's war chest. Okay, and, uh, and my role in that sort of thing was to sit on the other side of the uh, of the conference call, taking notes and, and checking that we got an accurate picture. Uh, for example, on the Turkey crisis, when I think you were probably still in Washington then, were you? But I remember you'd have been negotiating it on the UK's behalf. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Yes. So um, that's a remarkable thing to have been the G7 deputy during the last huge crisis. And I wanted to ask you a few questions about that. So what was the biggest thing you learned about economic policymaking from being at the coalface in 2008? Uh, well, I guess two things, really. Um, one is that uh, every crisis is different and knowing how to respond to the crisis is very much an art form rather than a science. Uh, you really don't know if what you're doing at a particular time is going to have the, the effects that you hope it will. Uh, so, for example, we, we were trying to fix the banking systems in our countries. Uh, we were trying to avoid a global depression by taking fiscal actions primarily. 
we tried to ensure that people didn't introduce protectionist measures um, and we tried to make sure that the international financial financial institutions had enough firepower to uh, help other countries that were getting into trouble. But we didn't really know whether we were doing too much, too little, uh, whether it would work. I guess the second lesson is that um, in times like that, working internationally uh, in a, as, as a certainly cooperative manner, if not a coordinated manner, um, actually helps. Take fiscal expansion, for example. Um, it was clear that uh, we were going to have problems if we didn't have fiscal expansion. Um, but standard theory would suggest that if, if you take measures like that, some of it leaks abroad. Um, so ac everybody acting together reduces the, the effect of that. It increases the bang for your buck in your own country. Um, it prevents markets from, from uh, betting against you by stopping buying your debt uh, because everybody's, everybody's doing the same. And it also helps to build up, and perhaps this is the most important lesson at the moment, it helps to build up a domestic constituency for taking these actions. If everybody else is doing it, it doesn't sound such a difficult thing or a, a silly thing for, for a country to do. And so international coordination and be prepared to um, uh, revise your plans if yes. they're not working. And the art of improvisation sounds quite important because there's never a direct precedent for what you're doing, is there? Um, never. And... Uh, Okay, so looking back on 2008, I was interested recently, I read Gordon Brown's autobiography, and he has a whole chapter on the 2008 to 9 stimulus package. It's obviously something he's very proud of as a government. So I guess uh, you can feel equally proud given that you negotiated it. But looking back on 2008, do you think it was well managed by the international community? And, and what do you think worked best to avoid a depression? We clearly made mistakes along the way. Um, Perhaps one of the biggest mistakes was we, we took so long to uh, recognize the depth of the problem. Um, as you recall, it, was, it started off in a relatively small sector in one country. It was a subprime mortgage problem yeah. in America. Um, that spread quite rapidly uh, across pretty much all countries. Um, the, the, the most advanced countries were the worst affected because that those were the markets that were typically um, affected. Um, and it spread across all parts of the financial system, that basically the, the wholesale markets closed down. That took several months to reach a peak. Um, had we acted sooner, we probably would have done better. Um, but um, I think once once people realised how bad things were getting, and this was this was about September or October of two thousand and seven, uh, the crisis probably had its origins in the spring to early summer of that year. Um, I think then the response was reasonably good. In fact. Very good. Uh, the central bank started by providing liquidity to make sure that uh, the systems didn't come, the financial systems didn't completely clam up. Um, we got a financial uh, a package of measures agreed to uh, reform financial regulation. So, so to try to um, you could say close the stable door after yeah. the hot horse had bolted, but but actually to try to make sure. That things didn't get worse uh, in the financial system. Um, it then took another few months uh, before countries were ready to um, come together uh, with a big stimulus package, fiscal stimulus package, when it became obvious that the problems in the financial sector were having real, yeah. real effects on the real economy. Um, but once that recognition was there, 
Um, I think we acted pretty quickly. Um, I think I think the fact that countries were pro- dissuaded from taking protectionist measures, uh, trade uh, trade protection, as had happened in the 1930s, um, I think the, the the combination of that plus ensuring that the IMF had enough enough uh, money at its disposal um, works reasonably effectively in uh, limiting the further spread of the crisis and in terms of uh, preventing what was clearly a global recession uh, descending into a depression. It's been quite interesting looking with students at some graphs of that era, because if you show students a graph of unemployment, for example, the last 40 years and tell and ask them when the big crisis was, they'll point to the 1980s. They don't point to two, because the unemployment didn't rise as much as it, it so easily could have done. So I think that's right. I think that the biggest impact has got to be on public finances, hasn't it? Which I, I know we'll come on to in a minute. OK, so on to coronavirus. Um, have we ever seen a crisis like this one before? And what do you think is the closest precedent? Well, as I said, all, all crises are different. Um, I mean, through my career, I've seen oil crises, um, uh, emerging market crises, yep. the Asian financial crisis, Russia, the breakup of the Soviet Union. They're all different. Um, it's important to try and learn lessons from what happened in the past, but, but it, the read across is never exact. Um, this is probably uh, going to be the shortest, sorry, the steepest fall in output we have ever seen. Uh, people are talking about uh, activity now 20, 30 yeah. percent below what it was three months ago. That's completely unprecedented. Um, are there are there press are there um, crises that look like this? Not really. Um, but the, the global financial crisis. way. Um, now, I just lost you there for a moment, so Stephen. I, 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 yeah, um, so you were saying the global financial crisis is some sort of precedent. Just explain that again. Uh, in the sense that the, in the global financial crisis, the, it's the, the effects spread very, very widely across the world and across industry. So uh, compared to other other uh, crises that were either contained regionally or were contained or were concentrated on one, one particular sector of the economy, um, this one is this one is just so widespread uh, and so deep that um, uh, it's it's difficult to underestimate the effect. Yeah, I mean, there's an irony about the fact that we've always talked about contagion as a financial. Um... Uh, a phenomenon, oh, whereas this is, a, of course, a disease that uh, uh, that is contagious. Okay, so um, what aspect of this are you most concerned about? Well, um, the fact that it is so pervasive going across all countries means that unlike in the global financial crisis, when at least uh, some of the emerging markets were still growing, uh this were, this is affecting all countries everybody will be seeing a sharp drop in output um so there's there are no countervailing uh forces at work um it's also it also is incredibly deep um you know the idea that uh i see that us unemployment claims are up to 30 million now that's uh, probably about 20% of the workforce would be my guess. Um, that's huge, absolutely huge. And the impact on the fiscal uh, side of things will be equally huge. The, the idea that governments are paying, paying uh, most of the wages of many of the workers in the country uh, is just completely unprecedented, in my opinion. Um, 
The final thing I worry about is that at the moment, uh, and until and unless there's a solution on the health side, there's no obvious way out. No, uh, uh, no I haven't seen anyone suggest one. Okay, so um, is the current response from UK policymakers right? I mean, is it too little, too much, the right direction, the wrong direction? Um, well, if you look at the UK, um, yeah, and, and I think that's that's true generally. Um, I think the economic response has been broadly right. Um, it's probably been a little bit slow, um, it, uh, just as on the health side, uh, I think the economic response was um, probably a, a, a few weeks too 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 slow. Um, but I think the fact that uh, they have acted at uh, in, in large quantities uh, is the right thing. There's been there's been a massive hit to both supply and demand in most of the countries. Um, you know the uh, companies, a lot of companies have just simply had to shut up shop. Um, left to their own devices, they would have laid off a lot of their workers. Um, those incomes would there, then not be available for people to spend. Um, so both the supply and the demand side have seen huge impacts. Um, in conventional demand terms, C plus I plus G plus X minus M, um, C was definitely very, very much affected. I definitely, definitely very much affected. Um, and X has largely disappeared because there's no trade to, to speak of. Um, there's only one thing left, which is G, government spending had, had to rise. Um, and I think the fact that, the, that most governments have come in uh, with large amounts of support, be it income support or loan guarantees, uh, is the right thing to do. Whether it <coughs> proves to be enough, we will see. Um, uh, but at least they have acted with great uh, with, with with great strength and magnitude. And um, I guess that leads to my next question, which is: we've heard a lot recently about L-shaped or V-shaped or U-shaped recoveries. Um, which do you think it will be, and what will what will determine that? I think it will largely determine how successful uh, countries are, are at um, uh, keeping a lid on the spread of the virus. Um, I suspect that countries that acted quickly and were effective at um, at containing the virus, the spread of the virus, will be able to ease their lockdown uh, levels more quickly. Um, South Korea, China, New Zealand, Australia, uh, they probably be, been the most successful at containing the spread of the virus. They should be able to return to some sort of normality quicker than, than other countries where the, 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 the spread has taken a lot longer to keep under control. Um, I, so I guess that in some countries you will see a fairly sharp recovery. Uh, in other in other countries, and I'm, I'm afraid the UK is probably one of those. I think the recovery will be much more drawn out over time. Um, it will take months, uh, uh, many months, I would have thought, before we start to get back to the sorts of levels of outputs that uh, that we saw before the crisis. So it's an unusual economic crisis in that the main solution is medical and public health rather than anything financial. I would have thought so. Um, the, the economic and financial measures can mitigate the impact. Um, I mean, without those economic support measures, um, things would have been a lot worse. The, the, I'm sure the uh, recession would have been much deeper. Uh, it would have had greater impacts on confidence so that the recovery would have been even more delayed. Um, but ultimately, I just don't think that things can get back 
uh, to anything near normality until the health sort, the health system, the health crisis has been um, addressed to a fairly large degree. Yeah, I guess what we've been discussing in class, sort of A level terms, is um, that, that although there will be a significant impact on aggregate demand, what you don't want is a massive impact on productive potential from lots of bankruptcies, lots of scarring of unemployment, that sort of thing. So hopefully that's been averted, but we shall see. Um, do you think the UK has arrived at this crisis in good economic shape or could we have been better prepared? I think by and large the UK was, was in reasonable shape um, with one proviso, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, uh, I think it, the UK had been reasonably successful at rebuilding the public finances after the, the global financial crisis, which was obviously a huge hit uh, in terms of rising debt levels. Um, it, and it's been a long slog to get to that position. But I think we probably got to the position where um, uh, debt and deficit levels were largely under control. Um, also, the UK economy is relatively uh, uh, agile and able to shift resources. Uh, it's got a relatively flexible labour market. It's got um, a business climate that allows allows um, companies to respond fairly quickly. So the supply side is relatively efficient in the UK. Uh, my one proviso is that um, uh, Brexit <laughs> has been um, at the very least a distraction over the last few years. And it's still, I think it's still weighing on, um, on confidence. I think it will take uh, companies longer than they would otherwise have taken to rebuild investment for it, for instance because there's because not only do they have the uncertainty of uh, the pandemic but also they don't know what the trading system will be like after after the end of this year there's been surprisingly little discussion of, of how the trade talks are going whether there might be an extension which seems a very important point to clarify at some point um we shall see okay um is sorry. Do you think there are any lessons we could learn from the past or from other countries about how to tackle this crisis? I mean, you've, you've spoken eloquently about the public health and medical side. Um, is everyone doing much the same economically, or is anyone doing something interesting and innovative? As far as I can tell, most people are doing much the same things uh, to a greater or lesser degree. Um, so. Uh, most governments are providing some form of income support uh, to, to people who would otherwise have lost their jobs. Um, most governments are doing so, taking some measures to uh, provide uh, support, mainly through loan guarantees to companies. Um, most countries are also doing that on the, or concentrating on the fiscal side rather than monetary, although the monetary central banks are being supportive where they can, but this isn't, uh, this isn't a crisis where, where monetary policy can do very much, in my opinion. Well, there's very little room um, for so manoeuvre think, anyway, isn't there? I'm sorry? There's very little room for manoeuvre, certainly on the interest rate side, is there? That's right, that's right. Uh, there's no, no room for manoeuvre. Central banks are still doing uh, more QE, constitutive easing, um, but I suspect that will have relatively little impact compared to the fiscal side. So I think most countries are doing uh, doing the same sorts of things. I think where it varies is, is how aggressive they are being in terms of uh, 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 supporting, uh, trying, having uh, counter recessionary measures in place. Um, and I think um, I guess one lesson I took, have taken from previous crises is that because you don't really know how much you should do, you should probably err on the side of doing too much rather yeah. than too little. You can always reverse the measures relatively quickly if you find that they're working too well. Yes. Um, but it's very difficult to catch up if you start with very small steps. Okay. Um, 
Do you think now, I mean, public debt levels have to go up very significantly as a result of this. Is there any alternative to a couple of decades of austerity to pay back those debts? Well, you're right. Uh, deficits will be enormous. Uh, debt levels will rise very quickly. Um, the, the normal arithmetic applies. Um, if you if you are adding to the debt stock, um, you will that that in itself will have uh, unpleasant effects because you'd be paying interest uh, on those debt stocks. So, which in turn will impact back on the deficit. You can you can get yourself into uh, very nasty fiscal arithmetic. Um, and if if this, this crisis goes on for very long, uh, the debt levels will go up enormously. Um, the, the debt levels in the UK at the moment are about 50%. Um, people are talking about them going to 100, 150% of GDP. Um, that is considerably higher than we ever got to in the global financial crisis. Um, and I th therefore, if you followed the normal paradigm, um, you would take that much longer to uh, to get back to sustainable levels. Uh, I mean, the, the normal paradigm, of course, is you get your deficit down. Uh, and there are only two ways of doing that. You cut expenditure or you raise taxes or both. Yes, well, the former um, being the more popular one recently, but I guess we might have to look at the second one as well. I think you probably will have to, uh, given the scale of the of the challenge. Um, there is, people are starting to talk about um, another way out. Uh, they are starting to um, ponder as to whether we've got the, the the challenge is so large that people might start um, accepting that creditors are going to have to take some of the pain as well. Well, but owners of public sector debt? Absolutely. I mean, for example, um, uh, somebody who used to work in the Treasury and is now and then worked at the FT has, has come up with a suggestion that um, uh, we should have, uh, in effect, monetary financing of the deficit. Okay. Um, in a, uh, base, basically, the, the, the Bank of England has already said it's going to buy government debt uh, directly, which uh, the ECB, for example, has outlawed because it's regarded as, uh, as highly inflationary. Uh, the Bank of England has said it's going to do so because of the unusual circumstances we're in. Um, it's not unreasonable to, uh, or so it's not out of the realms of possibility to say um, that the Bank of England should take um, a large chunk of government debt onto its books and not charge interest. Okay, would you in, be worried about... In effect, in effect hold um, zero coupon <laughs> perpetuals. Okay, but um, presumably based on printing its own money to buy those? Correct. Okay, uh, in increasing the money supply and thus... Would that be inflationary? Uh, I would argue not at the not at the present time. Right. Okay. Um, it's uh, when you when you're in such a, a deep uh, recession in terms of both supply and demand, there is no there's no inflationary pressure at the moment. Uh, if it if it emerges, then um, then maybe you can do something about it. Um, but other gov governments throughout history have, have basically dealt with some of their debt crises by inflating them away. Yes, with, with, so with some side it effects. Is not, it is not a completely stupid idea. Okay. I, um, who, who was that that was suggesting that, the, the, the Treasury? That was a guy called Clive Crook. Oh, right. So, who, same, uh, same surname. Uh, he was right. Where was he writing? Um, I saw it referred to in an FT article. And um, oh, that's right. He's he he's now a commentator for Bloomberg. Okay. So you can find him on Bloomberg. I'll look that one up. I thought for a minute you were talking about haircuts or partial defaults, but but you're thinking more of the well, monetary. Well, it could side. be. It could be. 
yes. I mean, the fact is that the private sector, private sector uh, creditors are going to have to start to take some of the pain as well. I mean, the, fa the fact that um, retailers are calling for rent holidays from commercial landlords, that's in effect a way of sharing the pain between the, the borrower and the lender. Yeah. Um, so there are, there are uh, I suspect that um, uh, the fact that people are starting to talk about um, finding ways of mediating on contract disputes. Did you see a few days ago there was a legal panel basically suggesting that rather than everybody spending uh, the next several years in court trying to negotiate uh, or trying to reach, reach a resolution on, on contract disputes, um, that they sh there should be widespread resort to mediation. If you go down that route, then again, it's a burden sharing. It's a, okay. it's a pain sharing solution. I think we're in quite, quite radical territory, and I suspect we may well need some fairly radical solutions to this. Interesting. Okay. Um, you mentioned Europe earlier, and I was going to ask you um, I mean, um, about the debt crises that we've recently seen in, in Southern Europe. Do you think those will be renewed? And do you think there's any uh, danger to the integrity of the, of the Eurozone from that sort of process? Um, the short answer is yes and yes. Um, I, find, I think it's incredibly difficult to think that Italy and Spain, for instance, uh, are going to um, find it easy to get, get out of this problem. Um, they started with relatively poor public finance positions. Um, Italy has now had a, a, a downgrade, so it's just one notch above junk bond status really? for its government bonds. Um, so it will find it more difficult and more expensive to borrow on markets, um, but the scale of its problems mean that it's going to have to. Uh, it's going to have to um, have a f big fiscal stimulus in place um, for some time. Um, so I suspect these countries will find it very difficult indeed. Um, will that cause problems for the euro? Eurozone itself, um, yes, because uh, ultimately, uh, I, I've for a long time thought that the Eurozone is unsustainable unless you move more further towards fiscal union. Um, the northern countries are very opposed to that. You've seen already the response to the suggestion that there should be coronavirus bonds issued, which um, which are basically a way of ensuring that all countries, whether irrespective of their fiscal position, um, can borrow at the same interest rate. Um, the northern countries have, have rejected that, um, and that means that the potential relief that the southern countries can get from that route is is, is closed. Um, you see the politics in the EU uh, and the Eurozone uh, as getting more and more difficult. Um, I think that the the way in which the the lack of solidarity shown within Europe is playing out means that the the populist pressures that were already there um, in the southern countries um, are just going to get worse. Whether whether it results in any major disruption, I don't know. Uh, my guess is that the most likely outcome is, as always, that the EU and the Eurozone will, will muddle through. Uh, they'll find some way of... Uh, giving support. The, the Commission have already come forward with proposals for uh, some sort of solidarity fund, uh, which will transfer some fiscal resources to, uh, to these, the countries worst affected. Um, but it, I don't think it solves the underlying structural problems in the Eurozone in particular. Um, as, as you know, we, we have the Euro, cri Euro crisis 10 years ago, which was um, 
which had similar roots to it, which was a fiscal problem in some countries uh, being solved by banks in, in, other, in, in the Eurozone as a whole being encouraged to lend to those countries. And then when those those uh, that those debts started to go sour, the banks themselves were under real pressure. Uh, they were facing insolvency, so they had to be bailed out by the by the richer countries. Um, yeah, I can see the same sort of problem playing out. Um, a lot of it will come uh, down is, to uh, northern countries and their willingness to uh, to, to cross subsidise the southern ones and their fiscal difficulties. Precisely, that, that that's what it all boils down to. Um, uh, every big country, uh, you know, a big country uh, like the UK or the US, basically does fiscal transfers across across the regions and and states of the of the country, and that's regarded as perfectly normal. Uh, there are no such mechanisms to any great degree in Europe. They have and to bargain each time. You get there. I'm sorry? There has to be a bargain each time rather than a sort of well-established process like the Barnett formula or something like that. Precisely, precisely. Or or the way in which um, uh, state taxes are, are set out yeah. in the US. Okay, Steve, now final one for you then. Um, in 50 years' time, how do you think we'll look back on this coronavirus crisis? Oh, that's a tricky one. Um, I'm tempted to say um, it depends on how successful we are at managing it. Um, I, if we, um, if it turns out that the the uh, downturn is very short, there's a very sharp recovery, um, and everybody can pat themselves on the back for having um, uh, managed the situation brilliantly well. Um, then people will look back on it and say it was an awful it was an awful situation, but we managed it very well. Um, it could be that we are that the outcome is a lot worse than that. Um, so I, 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 you know, the conventional wisdom is the Great Depression in the thirties um, was that terrible because we because it lasted so long so many people were out of work um, so many people lost lost their livelihoods and their their assets um, the global financial crisis on the other hand was relatively relatively mild by comparison um, there was very little hit to unemployment as you said um, we, we we recovered reasonably quickly. Um, I think a lot of that is down to the to, to, to the way in which the responses were managed. Uh, in the first case, uh, countries resorted to protectionism. They uh, they they they, they um, contracted their fiscal uh, positions, um, and that was, that was exactly the wrong thing to do. Um, we shall see. We shall see, I'm afraid. Well, I was going to ask in particular about the threat to globalisation. Um, I mean, there must be one and it must depend on how events come from here. Yes. Well, I think the um, the pressures for globalize, a globalised response are there, uh, but they're not being met. I mean, I think, I think it's unfortunate that we have... Um, the administration in the US that we have, which basically doesn't seem to care anything about um, uh, about building a an international response to to the problem. Uh, indeed, rather the reverse. Um, Trump spends most of his time blaming other people and other countries for um, uh, short the, the the problems that the US is facing. Um, I think we're in a situation where, in the short term, at any rate, for the rest of this year, uh, there will be no globalised response. Um, there is the risk of greater protectionism when we start to come out of this. Uh, we're already seeing seeing that to some extent, um, and I think um, a lot will play 
on the, uh, the presidential election at the end of this year. Well, that, I think it's probably a good point to uh, to, to end our, our interview. Um, thank you ever so much, Stephen, for your wisdom there and for your very interesting comments. And um, it was lovely.